Now, I've been introduced already, so I'll just tell you a bit about our ministry. Creation Ministries International is kind of unique because we employ more PhD scientists than any other Christian ministry in the world that we know of. I'm not one of them. But our ministry has two goals. One, we want to encourage you in your faith. We want to let you know that it's okay to believe the Bible right from the very first verse. There's loads of scientific evidence that backs up what the Bible says about history. Now, it's not that we're looking to science to prove the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. That's our authority. But we do find that the science backs up what the Bible says. And we also want to equip you to give a defense of your faith to people that you know who are skeptical and have some questions like, how did Noah get all those animals on the ark? Or what about dinosaurs? What about distant starlight? Lots of people have those kind of questions. And we want to provide you with information to help you defend your faith answers that go along with what the Bible says. And as an information ministry, we have a website. Our website is fairly easy to remember. It's called creation.com. Remember that title, because uh, it might be a test later. <laughs> There's over 10,000 articles on this one website. It's a good place to go if you have any questions about anything to do with how science fits with the Bible, about Noah's Ark, about uh, the Ice Age, any kind of thing that has something to do with science and the Bible. Good place to go for information. Another good place for information is what we call InfoLite. Now this is an email newsletter that we have. And uh, what we do is we send out a little bit of our information by email from time to time. I'm going to ask that we uh, pass these clipboards around for a moment. If you would like to receive a little bit of our information in your email, all we need is your name and your email address, and we'll start sending that out. And so I'll ask that you uh, pass those clipboards along while we go through the rest of the talk. <coughs> Now, a few years ago, a co-worker of mine told me a story about his niece. She was about five or six years old at the time, and she had recently heard the creation story from the Bible. How God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. After hearing the story, this little girl apparently said, How do you know? Who was there? I said, Those are valid questions. It may surprise you to hear me say that, being a creationist, a Christian. Why would I call those valid questions? Because if we think about this logically for a moment, let's take a quick review of the creation story from Genesis 1. God said, let there be light, and he separated light from the darkness. There was evening and there was morning one day. On the second day, God created the expanse around the earth. Day three, God separated the land from the waters and created vegetation. Day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. On day five, he created the fish and the birds. On day six, God created all of the land animals and finally man in his own image, both male and female. On the seventh day, he rested. So you can kind of see the little girl's logic here, can't you? She's so thinking, like, there weren't any people around until day six. How do you know? Who was there? I said, I hope she uses the same kind of logic when she goes to school and, you, and they tell her about the Big Bang and evolution. You've probably heard this story before as well. How almost 14 billion years ago, nothing exploded and became everything. And then about 4.6 billion years ago, planets, including the Earth, began to form. About a billion years after that, there were lifeless chemicals on the face of the earth, and from those lifeless chemicals came the first tiny living organism, life from no life. And then over the course of billions and millions of years after that, that tiny organism gradually evolved into something more complex and more complex again, until we got fish and amphibians and birds and so on, and finally, modern man evolved. All of this over billions of years. I said, I hope she uses the same logic and asks, how do you know who was there? Because if we compare those two histories, we find that for creation, we've only got five and a half or six days to account for before there were people around to tell the story. For the evolution or the naturalist story, 
There's billions of years of what they call prehistory with nobody around. Now, of course, that's not the only difference in the stories, is it? After all, how do we know the creation story to start with? We've read it. It's written down in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. And speaking of God, there he is in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That answers one of those questions right there. Who was there? God was there. Before there was man or an earth or time itself, there was God. And God inspired eyewitnesses like Moses and others through history who were witnesses to what God has done to write these things down in his written word. And of course, God himself is an eyewitness to his own creation. And he made sure that this got written down in such a way that we could read it and understand it even today. So to compare those histories again, for creation, we've got a written record. We've got eyewitness testimony. And behind it all is God. For the evolution or naturalist story, there is no written record, no eyewitnesses for billions of years, and no God. Or at least no God required. Because really that whole story is just an idea put forward to try to answer the question, what if there's no God? If there's no God who created everything, then there it must be nothing out there but the material universe. And therefore it somehow created itself over billions of years. Now somebody might be thinking, well wait a minute, hasn't science proven that the earth is billions of years old? Let's consider some key points about science to start with. First of all, evolutionists don't have a monopoly on science. There isn't a big equal sign between the word evolution and science. They're not synonymous. Creation and science have gone hand in hand for many centuries. There are, however, two different types of science. There's operational science and historical science. And finally, the facts don't speak for themselves. Let's talk about operational science for a moment. This will be what you learn in science class at some point. We learn the scientific method of running experiments. You start with a hypothesis, an idea, a statement of what you think will happen under certain circumstances. For example, I might say that, that I could heat water to 98 degrees and it'll boil. Then I'd run some experiments and record my findings. And I think we all know, no matter how many times I heat water to 98 degrees, it's not going to boil. But if I go to 100 degrees Celsius, it'll boil every time, at least at sea level. See, we know that because somebody's already run those experiments and found that out. This is the kind of science that is repeatable, testable, observable, and is predictable. But it's not to be confused with historical science. This is a term we use when we try to use science to figure out what happened in the past. Now, the best way to know what happened in the past is to have an eyewitness. But if we don't have one, all we can do is look at the evidence in the present and try to figure it out from there. But science is limited in doing that. Because science is all about making tests and observations in the present. You can't really run an experiment on something that's already happened in the past. So there's a limitation there. And the facts we find don't speak for themselves. Let me give you an example. Suppose we find a dinosaur bone. It doesn't come with a little tag attached that says, Hi, I'm Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I lived 65 million years ago, and I've got a big head and small arms, and I'm purple all over, and I love to sing and dance. <laughs> Who remembers Barney the dinosaur? Unfortunately. That guy used to bug me. <laughs> Point is, that bone does not come with that much information. So instead, we have to make an interpretation on the evidence that we find. And our interpretations are always based within a set of presuppositions. A framework of ideas, or biases, if you will, that we already hold to be true. And everybody does this. There's really no such thing as an unbiased scientist. The creationist, for example, starts with the notion that God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible is real history. And our interpretations are based within that framework. For the evolutionist, or the naturalist, they say, well, there is no God. All there is out there is the material universe. Therefore, it had to create itself over billions of years. And so you end up with two very different interpretations based from two different sets of presuppositions but of the exact same piece of evidence. Now many times the interpretation is put forward as if it's proven fact. We see this all the time. We see it in science journals, media, school curriculum. Of course we're going to find it on websites. 
Now, I've got nothing against this particular website, but here's an example of what I'm talking about. Up at the top, we find the word dinosaurs. That's the fact. No one would dispute that dinosaurs lived at some point in time. We've got loads of fossil evidence. But further down in the text, we find a statement that says these creatures first appeared about 230 million years ago. That's the interpretation. It's an interpretation based on the presupposition that the universe created itself over billions of years, one thing evolved into another, and that's where dinosaurs fit in that paradigm. But see, it's been put forward here not as an interpretation, but rather as proven fact. That's something we could call indoctrination. It starts with the little kids' books before they even go to school. We tell ourselves we want our children to be critical thinkers, to examine things and ask questions. But it can be hard to be a critical thinker when you're only ever given one interpretation year after year after year, from the time they're a little kid reading a dinosaur book all the way to university. Now, a lot of what we're talking about here, of course, has to do with the book of Genesis. That's the book we go to in the Bible to find out about origins, about ancient history. And some might be thinking, well, you know, I heard Genesis was a side issue. It's not real history, it's not about science, it's not as important as other doctrines like the Gospel, for example. Well, let's see how important Genesis is. Start with Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gospel message. The wages of sin is death. Because there's sin, there's death. That's the bad news. The good news is, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, who paid the atoning sacrifice for our sin on the cross once for all and rose from the dead, we can have eternal life. But it all hinges on the notion that the wages of sin is death. Where do we get that idea? Take a look at Genesis 2. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, God had created plants to be food for all of the animals and for people at the end of day 6. Nobody was eating meat. No bloodshed, no carnivory. And specifically, he says you can eat from any tree, but you can't, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. The implication being, there wasn't any death in the world up until that point. There wasn't any sin up until that point. And we know the story. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They sinned, disobeyed God. That brought the curse of death into the world. They received physical and spiritual death, which we inherit from them. And everything in the world dies. You see, the book of Genesis has got to be real history for the gospel to make sense. Think about it. If there was not a literal Adam who literally sinned and literally brought literal death into the world, then why would we need a literal Savior to die a literal death on a literal cross and literally rise from the dead to save us from our sins? Genesis has got to be real history for the gospel to make sense. And we find a number of other major doctrines have their beginnings in Genesis. This is where we first find out things about God and about the Messiah. We learn about marriage and even why we wear clothes. Genesis is foundational to the rest of the Bible. Now somebody might be thinking, you know, we hear so much about evolution. Maybe they go together somehow. Maybe somehow God used evolution or we can mash those two stories together in some way. Let's see how well that works. We'll start with the uh, Bible story of creation, those six days. And let's see if we can add in now the evolution story, as represented by those many, many layers of, of rock that are full of fossils. Fossils, we're told, represent millions of years of, of evolution. Now, of course, that means we're talking about millions of years of death and disease and pain and bloodshed. Because they're not just bones in the ground. They represent actual creatures that lived and died. Creatures that killed one another. There's, there's bloodshed in the fossil record. There's even cancer in the fossil record. So we have to take that into account if we're going to try to roll that millions of years into the Bible. Let's see if we can put it in here before creation, before day one. Now, the problem we run into, of course, is that verse that tells us in the beginning God created. If God used millions of years of evolution before that, does, does that mean there were two beginnings? Did God start over and he didn't tell us about it? 
And don't remember, don't forget that God called His whole creation at the end of day six. He called it very good. If He used millions of years of death and disease, is He calling all of that pain and bloodshed very good? And how do we account for all of that death before sin? Because remember, death comes into the world as a result of sin. There's no sin until there's an Adam. And there's no Adam until day six. If God used millions of years of evolution to create, then you've got a whole lot of death going on in the world before sin, which means death is then not the result of sin, and then why do we need a Savior if it's just a natural thing? The whole gospel is undermined by that. Okay, so let's see if we can put those millions of years in baby during creation week. What if those days aren't literal days? Well, a couple problems there. The Hebrew in context is very specific. You can't interpret it anything other than a literal day. And then there's Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the Sabbath day. The seventh day, sorry. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is our week. Why is a week seven days long? Why are we supposed to work six days and rest the seventh? Because that's what God did. Now, he could have done it in an instant. He could have done it in billions of years. But he chose to do it in six days, and he set that as a pattern for us. Think about it. If each one of those days was really a billion years long, who's looking forward to Monday? <laughs> okay, Tuesday in this case. Right? If God wanted to, he could have created in billions of years, and he would have told us that. Instead, he set the pattern for us with those six days. And of course, here you still have the problem of death before sin. So the only place those fossils can go, because they represent death, is after sin. Therefore, after creation week. But can they be millions of years old? According in the Bible history, there's a problem. Because in Genesis 5 and 11, we find chronogenealogies. They give a measured number of years from this person to his son, then to his son, and so on. And you can add up that chronology from Adam all the way to Noah, and then from Noah all the way to Abraham, and it adds up to approximately 2,000 years. And even secular archaeologists agree that Abraham was born around 2000 B.C. So that gives us a total world history, then, as I said earlier, of only about 6,000 years. Clearly, millions of years does not fit in there. So if millions of years of evolution doesn't fit with the Bible history, then maybe we should alter our hypothesis of trying to put them together, and instead we could ask, are those layers of rock and the fossils really millions of years old? How long does it take to form a fossil? We've been told that it can be a slow, gradual process. And yet, we find things like this. Here's a fish eating another fish. And they're fossilized in that position. Do you suppose they stayed in that position for millions of years while they got gradually covered up in sediment? No, they would get decomposed before that. Living things have to be buried rapidly to become fossils. Otherwise, they're going to decompose and get picked apart. Rapid burial is required for fossilization like this. And we find examples of that all over the world. Here's one from Nova Scotia. A cliff face showing many, many layers of rock with different fossils in it. Now here's an upright tree trunk that's been fossilized in that position through many layers of rock. Layers that were told took millions of years to form. Do you suppose that tree trunk stayed upright like that for millions of years while it got gradually covered up? No, it would decay long before that. Something had to happen to bury that tree trunk rapidly for it to be fossilized like that. But then that would indicate that those layers of rock had to form rapidly. Is that even possible? Well, here's another cliff face uh, in Washington State. You can see the person at the bottom for scale. It's actually part of a canyon, and it's 100 to 150 feet deep in different spots. I'm old enough to remember when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. I was 13. You can do the math if you want. <laughs> but it was big news. I found out later there were actually three distinct events that happened over the course of two years. Each one happened on a single day. And each one of those events formed one of these major bands of rock you see here. In fact, that middle layer is full of all the, the tiny layering that they call varves. 
We're told one or two of those get laid down in a year, and then you get add those up, you get millions of years. Twenty-five feet thick of those bars were laid down in the course of three hours. Clearly, rock layers can form quickly. And of course, the canyon itself was also formed within a day, as mud flows came down from the mountain and carved out a canyon through the rock that was already there. Now, there is a river at the bottom of the canyon, which formed afterwards because water flows downhill. But if we didn't know any better, we might assume the river had carved out the canyon slowly over millions of years. That's what we've been taught. What a difference it makes when we have eyewitness testimony, we get a different interpretation of the same evidence. So where do we get the idea that rock layers always form slowly? It's an idea called uniformitarianism. A couple hundred years ago, geologists suggested that the present is the key to the past. So if you see slow and gradual sedimentation happening now, the assumption is it's always been like that and the distant past has never changed. But it doesn't take into account the possibility of some major catastrophe happening in the past. Something like Mount St. Helens, for example. Or how about a global flood, like the one we read about in Genesis in the days of Noah. Now, some would say that this was just a local flood and it got exaggerated, but what does the Bible tell us about it? It says there, the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. A stone as all the mountains under the sky were covered in water more than 20 feet deep. This was not a local flood. This was global. And can you imagine what you would find after that? Probably layer after layer of sediment full of dead things. Jesus referred to it himself here in Luke 17. He said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now he's talking about his second coming, a judgment to come. How sudden that will be, people will not be prepared, just as it was in the days of Noah. Jesus believed Genesis was real history. Do we believe Jesus? Peter believed the flood was real as well. He said in the last days, scoffers will come. And he said that they will go so far as to even deny a, a global flood. Because they'll forget that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now he too draws a correlation between that judgment of the past and a judgment of the future. And he refers to this as real history. And he says in the last days, scoffers will come and deny that a global flood happened. In our time, nobody denies a local flood. But many are denying a global flood. Now, someone might say, well, wait a minute. Creation, evolution, in the end, does it matter what I believe? Of course it matters. What we believe about God, about origins, your worldview has a profound effect on how you live your life. So it is for everybody that you know. Jeff Jacoby put it this way. He said, for in a world without God, there is no obvious difference between good and evil. There is no way to prove that murder is wrong if there is no creator who decrees thou shalt not murder. One might reason instead, as Lenin and Stalin and Mao reasoned, that there is nothing wrong with murdering human beings by the millions if doing so advances the Marxist cause. Or one might reason from observing nature that the way of the world is for the strong to devour the weak, or that natural selection favors the survival of the fittest by any means necessary, including the killing of the less fit. We might think of another major world leader from that sentence, someone from the last century, and his agenda, heavily influenced by Darwinism. So when we go back to those two histories and look at the bottom line, we can ask the question, if there's no God, then who says? If there's no God who created everything, who decides what the morals are? What's right and wrong? What should the laws be? In the Western world, for many hundreds of years, our laws and our, our idea of right and wrong were largely based on a biblical worldview. But in the absence of a God, then we become the decision makers. We become number one. Evolution is the atheist's best friend. Because if we can eliminate God, then we become number one. We can do whatever we want, make up the rules for ourselves. And that's kind of the thing we've been seeing in the last several decades. 
as we gradually drifted away from what God's ideas are of right and wrong and what the laws should be. In our culture, we've seen a shift away from that, and we're starting to make up the rules for ourselves. And as a culture, here's some of the things we end up with when we make up those rules on our own. We get things like legalized abortion, same-sex marriage, high divorce rates, higher rates of teen pregnancies, and all kinds of nasty side effects from our so-called freedom. Starting to debate euthanasia again, and eugenics hasn't totally gone away. You know, the sterilization of those considered unfit. All kinds of things that make sense in a worldview where there's no God. Where you're just random chance accident from pond scum and there's no particular purpose. You can decide for yourself. All kinds of side effects from that. And this is what we've been teaching our children for generations. That they're a random chance accident from nothing. Now here's one that hits home in the church. Many, many studies have been done, including by George Barna in the States a number of denominational studies and we've discovered that uh, on average 60 to 70 percent of young people who are raised in the church end up leaving the church by the time they're in their 20s and they don't come back and one of the biggest reasons they have for doing this or when you go on to college campuses is they say well science has disproven the bible evolution has disproven the existence of god we've got a dvd we put out called fallout that that illustrates that and what's happening to our young people by the time they get to university. And uh, evangelists that do street evangelism, a number of them have told us the same thing. They're telling us that the creation versus evolution issue has been the number one re- people, reason people give for forsaking the Bible and Christianity. It matters what we believe. Now you might be thinking, wow, all I really want to do is spread the gospel. I want to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ. And in creation ministries, we would agree that gospel is number one. That's why we do what we do. But you see, we recognize that people have questions. Before we can talk about spiritual matters, people have questions of an earthly nature. Questions like, well, why aren't there dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible, as we talked about earlier? Or who did Cain marry? Questions like, well, what about the Ice Age or distant starlight? What about natural selection and carbon-14? Don't those prove that evolution is true? Actually, natural selection and carbon-14 are better evidence for creation than for evolution. But you see, people have these kind of questions because they see a contradiction between what they they hear and what they read in the Bible and what they get taught in school and see in the media because they haven't been taught how science actually backs up the Bible. The good news is there are answers to all of those questions. There are biblically-based and scientifically sound answers for all of those now, Peter tells us that we should always be prepared to make a defense or give an answer for the reason for the hope that is in you. And so that includes things like testimony and sharing the gospel, but it also includes being able to defend our faith when skeptics come along with some of those tough questions. Maybe even people in your own family who are just having a hard time accepting the claims of the Bible because of what they've been taught elsewhere. Now, you're not going to remember a whole lot of what I said here today in a few weeks. For example, when you think about it, how many have forgotten the major points from the pastor's sermon from four weeks ago? Don't raise your hand. I had I said that in one church, the pastor raised his hand. <laughs> Truth is, you're going to forget this talk over time, and it's gone by very fast. So that's why we're an equipping ministry. We've always had information on hand because we want you to get some answers for yourself and get equipped to give some answers to other people. That's why we always have resources along with us. And our number one equipping tool is called Creation Magazine. It's a quarterly magazine that comes out every three months, family-oriented. The articles are short, colorful, and easy to understand. There's even a kids section in the magazine. And uh, uh, it's a recurring subscription. 750 every three months. What you do is you sign up for it once, have the uh, payments come off a credit card or a bank account, whichever you prefer, and then the magazine just keeps coming. If you want to cancel, just give us a call. And every three months for that 750, you get a hard copy of the magazine as well as a digital copy that you can download on up to five devices in your home. Now, if you want to sign up for the magazine today, I will give you your first issue here. And I will also give you a free DVD. And you pay nothing up front. It's just a sign So I'm going to ask that we send around these other footboards now as we finish up. And uh, you'll see 
some slips of paper that look like that. If you would like to receive Creation Magazine for yourself or as a gift for somebody else, what I need you to do is tear off one of those slips of paper, fill it out both on the front and on the back, and get all your information there, and uh, bring it to me over here after the service, and we'll get you set up with the magazine and your, and your free gifts, okay? Uh, it's a good way to get some, some answers, some information coming on an ongoing basis. Now, my next favorite resource is called Creation Answers Book. Now, this answers more than 60 of the most asked questions people have about creation, about uh, uh, creation evolution debate, things like a distant starlight or the ice age, and uh, it's a good resource to have as well. A good companion for that is called Christianity for Skeptics. This looks at a number of different worldviews, a number of religions, even atheism, and uh, compares them to Christianity and shows how Christianity is really the most logical one. Now, for the more scientifically minded, we've got Evolution's Achilles Heels. This is nine PhD scientists showing from the evidence how evolution just doesn't work. How the strengths that evolution say they have for their argument, like DNA and fossils, how they're actually weaknesses. So if you're really looking for some evidence like that, that's a good resource as well. Now, there's even a library pack over here that's got basically everything that's good for church libraries or for the real kingdom. I didn't come here just to sell you a bunch of stuff. Okay, please don't get that idea. Our ministry is all about equipping people with information so you can better defend your faith. And so, if you don't want to spend money, go to the website. Remember the name of the website? Creation.com. Creation. 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 I told you it would be a test. Remember those 10,000 plus articles? Loads of information there. You can send links to people that you know. And uh, I urge you to uh, come and visit me over here after the service. You can uh, ask some questions and uh, uh, get, uh, get equipped with some information.